to be able to look, look at yourself truly, like take a second, look in the mirror, recognize, you know, what's happening, who you are. It's not easy for people to do. The second you get told no, you have to flip it like you do to be a motivating factor and saying, okay, let me work on the reasons and come back stronger the next time. You need to work through the emotions that come with rejection. Allow yourself to feel sad. Allow yourself to be critical on yourself. Just go through those motions and then shake it off. And then be like, okay, what's my way forward? What's a plan that I can execute to just come back better and more improved? Welcome to the 2% Factor Podcast, where we explore the small micro decisions you make, you know, along your life's journey that end up having a big impact on what happens in your story. Uh, today we have with us, um, and, and are really excited to have with us, the winners of the Amazing Race for season 32, uh, Will Jardell and James Wallington. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, we're excited, excited to, to talk be here. to you. Why are we with jinx? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I should also announce and your two pups. Yeah. Yes, they are here on the floor, hanging out with so us. They may or may not hear them yep, playing at, at our feet. <laughs> they, they may participate. They may not. Yeah. <laughs> so up to them, right? Yeah. All right, good. So today on the episode, you know, we're really going to dig into kind of the untold story, right? Like, uh, so many people know you from winning the amazing race and such a tremendous accomplishment. And we want to kind of back up and yeah. break down how did things happen before that moment, right? Because a lot of times people just see people that are successful and have accomplished, you know, high achievements such as that, such as that. And they just think it happened or you got lucky or this and that. And and knowing both of you and your story, there's so many micro decisions and things that happen along the way that have shaped who you are as people and how things have, you know, transpired in your lives. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. I'm excited to break it down. So let's start, I think with you, Will, and, <laughs> and let's talk about, you know, when you look back at kind of your journey and some kind of critical moments for you, where does that start for you? It honestly starts at the beginning. My my parents really instilled in me and my sister this insane work ethic. Um, my parents were both teachers. My dad was also a coach. My mom owns a dance studio. And so they were working 14-hour days. Um, but also seeing them love what they do was a huge factor in just seeing how much work it actually takes to follow your dreams. I mean, there's parents that are like, you can do whatever you want. You can be whoever you want to be, but that doesn't really break down what it takes to get there. And so I think by seeing my parents and how hard they were working and what they were working towards, um, it really started from a young age, just watching my parents talk through the decisions at home or going to the dance studio or football games to watch my dad do uh, coaching for the, the football players. Um, it was very present in my life from, from the beginning. Mm. So where did, where did that kind of start coming together for you, right? Where did that gel and, and how did it gel in terms of, like how to operationalize that, right? Because that's the big miss for people. I, I think, so a lot of times parents are like, I expect my kids to get straight A's or good grades. And my parents never had to do that for myself or my sister. I think it became just part of me that I worked hard for myself, not because people were telling me that I should do this. Um, that goal setting and trying to, f- you know, finish high school um, with honors and all of those things, those were goals that I set for myself, not because someone told me that that's what I needed to do. Um, so that's kind of how it manifested in me at a young age. Mm. And so were there, were there like mentors along the way that helped shape that? Like what, how, how did that come together? 
There's there was a lot. I mean, my parents were great. I think my grandparents were also great, but I think I had one teacher, Miss um, Patterson, in seventh grade history. Um, she shout out to Miss Patterson she, if, she's li- <laughs> if she's listening or watching. Um, she was the first teacher that made education more than just memorization for me. She made it to where we're asking critical questions and trying to figure out the why of everything that was happening. And I think that that really inspired me in every aspect of my life to always ask why and find out more detail about situations. Because I mean, high school, elementary school, middle school, it's all just memorize and then regurgitate for a test and then you'll do well. Yeah. But I Cram, think being, Cram. yeah, yeah, yeah. Stay up till three, <laughs> memorizing, I don't know, vocabulary words. Um, but I think that challenge of okay this happened but why do we think this happened and how can we analyze it um happening for me at a a seventh grade at like 13 um really challenged my view of the world and how i approached learning um and even goal setting like why am i doing this what's the outcome um that can be accomplished from 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 what i'm doing so so let, let's go into this a minute because I, I find this really interesting, right? Like, so I'm, I'm a parent. Yeah. And so as a parent, it's interesting you look back at kind of seventh grade and I'm going, would I have known at that time as a parent that, that what you just described is shaping a massive mm-hmm. part of your future being? I have, yeah. I, that's a, I'm not a parent, not yet. <laughs> I can't imagine seeing like a 13 year old and thinking that they can handle um, critical thinking questions or um, broadening their horizons in a way that challenges them. Um, Sometimes I feel like that is not something that parents think about, especially when kids are, I don't know, before high school. Mm. When did you realize, Will, that the why mattered so much? Honestly, because it had implications. There were consequences for the decisions people made. And because it was a history class, you would look at wars and um, legislation and all kinds of different aspects. And you would see that those decisions and the reasons behind them had real world implications for people across the U.S. and the world. So I think connecting the decisions with the outcomes was like a huge shift in my thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay. So seventh grade, you have a great, you have a great teacher. You you realize the importance of, well, you start learning the why, because she's, she's made it a priority and you're learning. Mm -hmm. And then but that that's something for you and you're this is a part of this conversation because you realize later in life where that's played out like how has that played out later in your life and why um honestly just goal setting and figuring out my own personal reasons for why i do the things that i do Mm -hmm. um i think going into college i kind of started off doing what everyone expected. I feel like I was really good at science in high school. And so I was like, okay, I'll just go pre-med and be a doctor because that's like a pathway for loving science and um, kind of an expectation for parents want their kids to be doctors, lawyers, or those types of careers. And I think um, after two years of college and kind of losing myself to the expectations of others, whether it was professors or family or just the world expectations of, of career. Um, I kind of had a moment with an advisor and they were like, you have to do this. You can't add any other classes. You have to stay the path to go to a good school and be ready or whatever. And I was just like, this is like, crazy. I I want to do this, but I also want to not lose myself in this. And so I, against their wishes, added on a minor that was art and architecture history. So random with pre-med where I was taking 16 hours of science. And then I had art classes that I was taking as well. And so I think I refound myself by 
understanding my why is just broadening my horizons, learning as much as I can and bringing a multitude of perspectives into any career that I was going to do. And that meant not sticking to biology for four years. It meant really learning from different avenues, different um, classes, whatever it was. Um, that was like the first time I think that I kind of captured myself back and made decisions that I knew that I wanted and were good for me and my kind of path. That's so, so interesting. It's almost like a moment where you, you, uh, you owned being empowered. Yep. Right. Which, which, which listening to you on it gives you the confidence in the future yeah. to, to tap into that, right. To lean in to your instincts. My instincts are, I need some more creativity. I need to not listen to this one person who's telling me they, they have the formula yep. that I'm going to create my own formula and have my own confidence and trust my experience and intuition towards the future. When I think that we all know ourselves better than anyone else knows us. And I know my brain and how creative I can be. And I've learned about myself that I love bringing new ways of doing things into whatever I'm doing. So if I was, if I was going to be a doctor, I would want to bring that creativity and trying to solve problems in a new and interesting way. And by just sticking to the status quo of science, that wasn't going to lead me to the skill set that I wanted to develop and that I knew that I already had a foundation for. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because anybody listening to this podcast or watching would think they're going to hear about the amazing race right now. Like, <laughs> psych. <laughs> hey, what I happened on episode four? <laughs> <laughs> I have you. I mean, have you ever seen the movie um, Slumdog Millionaire? Yeah, of course. So when we ran the race, it a lot of our conversations by the end of it was every part of our life that we've learned something or been introduced to someone or seen something or tasted something or whatever we've done have led us to this moment. Yes, every decision that we've made has prepared us for this and it all just kind of came together in, in the race but those moments from the very beginning of your life you obviously can't put those on a television show but those really have such a huge impact on what prepares you for something like the amazing race i couldn't agree more will i mean where you are is where you're supposed to be mm -hmm. ain't that the truth <laughs> <laughs> But it's it's so funny, right? Because we're always trying to figure out how to move off that, right? And you see what's on social every every day. It's you know uh, somebody's trying to inspire or sell something. Yeah. And and um, you know where we're supposed to be is right now. And we didn't know this three months ago, six months ago, a year ago, et cetera. So um, I'm a I'm a big fan of that. I'm a big fan of that too. So we're shaping and kind of unfolding will right <laughs> so so yeah, i know it's a vulnerable process <laughs> it's kind of it's it's kind of great though reflecting um because sometimes you forget where you came from and what makes you you when you kind yeah. of get into the mundane of life and i think that remembering where you come from and what you've gone through or what you've learned is is something that kind of propels you forward um, when you do that time to reflect completely, I mean, that's what this whole thing is about. That's why I'm, I'm so, I, I love these moments, right? Because it's the whole point of anyone listening right now is we're trying to break down the untold story because what you see isn't typically, you know, enough information to help people understand how to get somewhere. You, you just see the final outcome. And there's is so much more before that, that, that evolved and needed to bake and yeah. build. And, and that's, that's to me, the most interesting thing of all of this, right? It's, and it, and it's honestly a, um, it's a recognition for both of you of everything that you did in order to get to the place where you achieved and continue to achieve. It's like looking back and, and saying, well, but people don't know about this. 
<laughs> and that would have changed everything. All right, so you got you got influences from grade school. Yep. Uh, university experiences where you captured your own um, empowerment and and started really trusting your instincts and and shaping classes that you were told not to take and 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 um priorities that yeah. probably you know all those kinds of things so then what what kind of happened how how did you take some of those experiences and how did they play out later in your life right like yeah. you talk about those early younger times where you learned to trust your instincts and learned to maybe um fight for yourself right how how did that end up playing out later for you in other aspects of life i think I had like a weird transition from college into like the real world. I, <laughs> uh, like right after graduation, about a month later, I participated in a reality show called America's Next Top Model. And I feel like that work that I did in college, though, really helped me understand who I am and what I want. Um, and so when I did Top Model, um, obviously reality tv you kind of have to fit this like box of like you are the loud funny person you are the sweet southern belle and i feel like it's like, you're, like you're almost like you're typecasted right? yeah yeah 100 yeah, and i feel like i was like the gay catholic i don't know, dancer dancer from <laughs> texas um and i feel like I didn't want someone else to have control of my narrative. I didn't want someone else to own what they thought that I was. And so at the beginning of the show, you do your first interview with the judges, which includes Tyra Banks. What, what year was this, by the way, Will? 2014. Okay. All so right. nine years ago, which is crazy. Yeah. Um, and when you go and do this first, like judging with them, you kind of introduce your, yourself and that's the first time you meet them. And I had asked the casting director, like, hey, I, I brought these, you know, six inch heels that I, I want to wear. And like, um, and they're like, no, no, don't do that. Don't wear those. Um, but I brought them in my bag anyways. And I would say probably about two minutes before going out there, I like put them on and made the decision for myself that I can't have someone tell me what and who I am. I need to make sure that I'm putting my, my entire self out there um, by doing this. So I wore the heels in front of the judges. And I think that that moment was like this massive inflection point for me because it was such a broad stage uh, vulnerability because the world was about to watch this. And I was in front of Tyra Banks and um, other famous people that I was completely putting myself forward and it was like a switch for everything after that moment of like always stand up for yourself always be yourself don't let people take control of who you are or what narrative they think belongs to you um and it just boosted that level of confidence with me being able to make my own decisions for myself and I was 23, so I was still pretty young of like, okay, from there on out, that was the moment that I made a decision that kind of propelled me forward. That is so cool. So let's, let's go here for a second. I, I, so, I mean, you're, you're, you're graduating from school. You've yeah. got your professional uh, path kind of in play and all of a sudden you're, you're, you know, competing to go on one of the biggest shows in, in reality TV. And, and not only that, it's America's top model. So like yeah. what you wear and all that stuff is, you know, it's huge. Yeah. It's huge. It's a huge decision. So I think, um, to just put that in perspective for a second, it, it, it it's a life changing moment that you had to have the courage to make a critical. I mean, it's, it, there is no more clear expression of a 2% factor moment. I agree because full transparency, it's not like you're, you make this decision, you're confident and it happens. The anxiety behind putting yourself out there in any capacity takes courage. Like you said, it also takes like getting over the hurdle that you put in front of yourself. Um, I remember just being like so nervous 
before walking out there because this was like a big deal to me and it did take a lot out of me to do it. But on TV, you see it and it's like, oh, it's just part of it. Like, it's just something that happened on the show. But that like 20 minutes before and even further than that was full of so much conflict and so much anxiety and really weighing out the pros and cons and trying to build myself up to do it. Amazing. Amazing. And so did that play out well? Yeah. I mean, yeah. for me, it did. I got second place. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. And have you experienced, you know, that was, you know, nine years ago, right? Have you experienced yeah. other like callbacks to that moment where other people, because you, you continued in reality TV, mm -hmm. right? Did, did that end up playing back again for you? Or is that purely a personal like thing for you? Um, I think coming away from top model, I was able to make decisions with way more confidence than I think I would have before the show. I mean, you walk away from reality TV and like, that's a whole other beast. But I think with that part of it, um, it really allowed me to be able to make decisions and, and be really confident about those decisions that I was making. Yeah. Good. Well, and I can see at such a, you know, relatively young age, really 23. Yeah. You, you, you've got a life defining moment on your hands and you've got to decide what you're going to do yeah. and, all, and, and, all, and you're rolling all the dice, right? Yeah. I mean, to, to have a shot at that audition and, and, uh, is an achievement within itself, let yep. alone once you're there having to make those calls. So such an, such an interesting, um, decision point for you. And, and I'm, I love how it played out. Okay. So to put this story together a little bit, so Will and James, did you guys meet back at that time around yeah. top model? Okay. Yeah. When Will's talking about the whole, like the casting director told me not to wear my heels. I was there for that moment. Yeah. You I, were? Yes. I remember her telling him not to wear the high heels. So when I saw him come out in them, I was like, wow, that's such an attractive quality in someone that like he said, screw what you have to say. I'm going to stay true to myself and look where it got him. All right. And true to yourself as Elle Woods from Legally Blonde says, never goes out of style. And he did that. Yeah. And look, he got second place. Yeah. <laughs> Should have won. I'm not being biased, but. <laughs> it's, it's so cool that actually you as a couple that you know you saw that character you know because you're right it takes boldness to to um you know take the road less traveled and yeah, yeah. and trust your instincts and i think sometimes it's hard for people to to it's such a great story you tell because i i know there's people listening and watching that are in some of those decisions right now i mean even setting the stage a little bit more i had never worn heels in front of anyone except at like a dance class and i had only like come out to my parents and sister at the time like wow i was putting myself completely out there um to be judged and vulnerable with the entire world um, in so many ways, not just the heels, but here I am, like I'm yeah. here, I'm doing this for me and I'm going to put my entire self out there. So it wasn't just like, oh, am I wearing heels or not? It was so much behind it as well, which you can't capture, um, in like, I don't know, two minutes on a TV show. <laughs> no, yeah. no, no, you can't. And it, it's hard to even capture, you know, at this moment, all the emotion and, and, um, yeah. thoughtfulness that goes into all that super, super cool to hear the, the way in which you had to deal with that challenge and the way that you, and that's, I'll, I'll say this about that too. It's almost like you chose though, you, you, yourself made a decision for that to be an opportunity. Yep. You know what I mean? Like if you, what if you wouldn't have thought of that? What if you wouldn't have been creative? What if you wouldn't have, have been a risk taker at some level, you know, the ambition that you have that started, you know, young, you had to recognize that you're going to think of something that you could do that'll make you stand out and differentiate yourself. Yep. And, and whether it's a, you know, a top model reality television, or you're in, you know, a different industry that's completely different. 
it does start with you. I mean, you, yeah. you did take that moment and made that moment yours. You have to, you have to create opportunities for yourself. Nobody else is going to do it for you. <laughs> like you have to take risk. And I think that that's kind of why we work so well together is because we create things for us mm -hmm. and we also aren't afraid of taking risks in every aspect of our life. So I think that even though it was a reality TV show, like you can't not take risk in your professional career with relationships with others with your i don't know you're afraid to get a dog you're afraid to like do all these things there's so many things that you're missing out on in life if you don't take that first step and that risk um of being just scared of doing something yeah that's so true okay so 2014 you're in heels yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 uh, you take the road less traveled, um, and you go down that path, you and James meet yeah. on that show. Like not on it, but like, yeah, like I, I mean, James is in the audience in the first episode of the show as like a, <laughs> like a viewer of the experience, yes. which is funny now because, I mean, now we're married and, um, but yeah, we met and started dating probably right after, like a month after I got back from filming. Right around that time. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so James, it, and we'll go into kind of what happened with you two, you know, from there and, and yep. towards the amazing race. But so you you and Will really kind of introed around that time and and then um, obviously grew to where you are today. But back us up a little bit on your journey. And where do you start when you think about the 2% factor moments for you that, you know, that kind of formed <laughs> where you were headed? Yeah, I mean, well, I grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I'm adopted. So I think growing up, I was very fortunate to have the family that I did because they were so incredibly supportive of just anything my sister and I put our minds to. I think that they instilled, as much as they did work ethic, they instilled a strong sense of community within us. Like we were very active at church with our youth group, church choir, we were doing school activities. And I think getting a strong sense of community is kind of what aided in a lot of my successes along the way because i i thrive with social settings i love meeting new people i love forming intentional bonds and relationships with people and none of that would have probably come to light with who i am if it wasn't for my parents teaching us growing up how important community is whether it's with family or with friends or with coworkers, whoever it might be so at a very early age, I was very involved with activities, but with that came its own fair share of hurdles because I'm a closeted gay kid who struggled with confidence and trying to really find my footing and what it meant to be gay in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And because of that, I, I never really found my footing until I came across theater. And putting myself on a stage in front of an audience of people really helped me come into my own. It really helped me build the confidence that I needed. And by the time I was in high school, I had an incredible theater teacher, Mrs. Demeester. She was one of my favorite teachers. I've Shout ever out to Mrs. Demeester. Yeah. <laughs> Mrs. Demeester. She was my theater teacher and she kind of knew, I don't want to say like I was an outcast in school, but I wasn't, you know, labels in school popular by any means. So she really took me under her wing and would I would get to eat lunch with her at school like every day and we would have incredible conversations just about life and just what my goals and my ambitions were. And she really invested a lot of her time as a teacher in me to hear me out and what my voice was. And hey, then- James, I'm curious real quickly, do you, does she know this? I I wouldn't be shocked if she okay. did. Yeah, uh, I think. I mean, because that's really like, uh, you know, for her listening. Like, if you think about what that, you know, any that moment that what that was for you, yeah. how it helped shape you, and how now later in life you're so grateful yes. for that. It's such a great reminder for those that are looking for opportunities to help other people and reach out and be intentional with recognizing someone that um, you can you can help nurture. 
Yeah. And so I just, I just say that because when you, it's, it's so cool when you talk about that because you're so appreciative of, oh, of what she did and how it helped you. Well, she gave me another sense of community, the theater kids in school. We were the theater nerds and it was like the best <laughs> memories of my entire high school memories. It just, I loved everything that Mrs. Demeester gave to me in school. And not only that, during that time, you know, I'm struggling with learning disabilities. I'm mm. ADHD, ADD. I struggle with anxiety, reading comprehension. So I wasn't like a straight A student, not even straight B sometimes. It was usually B, C on average. And I was really hard on myself because I was like, am I not good enough? And a lot of the times she was able to help me learn. And same with this other woman, Rebecca Shankland, Miss Shankland, loved her. She, she took the time... And when I had to do testing, I got additional time to take tests because of the learning disabilities that I struggled with. And I would get to go sit in this little room with her at my school, and she gave me as much time that I needed. It was always James's time. And she never rushed me. She let me kind of work through problems on my own terms. She would walk me through them so I could find a way where I would, I would be able to comprehend it. And so I just think because of these women in my life in high school, it did instill a level of confidence in me, but also pushed me into the direction that I did, which was more of a creative pursuit. Like yeah. I am not a bookworm by any means. I think I'm more street smarts than anything. And that's a lot of because of my family and these two women as I was growing up. Uh, I will it's such a it's so interesting when you look back at the things that shaped you. Um I understand a little bit about the adoption world. My sister has adopted um I say over ten children because I, I, there's, there's, she's really just been committed to this mm, for that's beautiful. 20, yeah. 30 years, because there's so many children out there that don't have a home and different circumstances that have come right. along. And she's ended up actually adopting more than 10, I want to say 11, um, that are now my nieces and nephews yeah. and that I have long-term relationships with and have fostered over a hundred. Wow. So I, I do understand what you mean by, you know, this is part of your story, right? Mm -hmm. This is part of your, your journey. And, um, it's, it's terrific to, to see how that's played out. So when you look back at those building blocks, if you will, through school, did that, did that end up playing out for you in terms of these community lessons and how, how does that end up playing out for you as time went on? I think the biggest thing that comes to mind is rejection. I think being put into situations where rejection might come, because I think rejection can come in any form. It can come in being denied a job opportunity. It could be in a dating pursuit with someone you might be interested in. It could be putting yourself out there for an audition. It could be like a huge show you want to be a part of and then being told no. And because I had exposure to that very early on, the sense of rejection, got easier over time to the point where even anytime I was told no, I was able to turn that into an opportunity to be like, okay, well, I will come back better next time. I'll, I'll show you why you told me no wasn't the right answer the first time. And here we are, like with everything that I've ever done, it's always been opportunities where I've been told yes or no. And anytime I've been told no, I don't take that lightly. I don't take no for an answer. And it just lights a fire under my ass to even come back stronger and better than ever. And then it gets people to think, wow, we shouldn't have said no in the first right. place. That's so, so cool. So I, I'm guessing too, uh, Will, that just like James reflected back on something he saw with you in terms of that, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going to wear the heels. Um, yeah. I would think that that, in which you see from him, like in terms of his ability to just persevere is something that you have witnessed, I would guess, through through time as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's an incredibly attractive quality. I think when we started dating um, at that time, he had already applied to <laughs> just the amazing race, like six times by that point. <laughs> before, um, you, before you two got together? Or before, before we got together <laughs> with like every family member and all these things. And every time he made it further in the process and got told no, but you could see the fire. Like it didn't discourage you from following that dream or following that path or passion 
um, to make it happen. And I think that's like the one thing that I see. I teach dance as well. And I, that's the one quality that I see is kids when they get criticized or are given feedback or don't get an audition or don't win an award, hmm. they shut down. They completely remove themselves from the situation and sometimes they'll cry. Um, and I think that that's not the path to go. That's not what sets you apart and it's not what propels you forward in any industry, whether it's dance or with applying to reality TV or castings, auditions, jobs, whatever. The second you get told no, you have to flip it like you do to be a motivating factor and saying, okay, let me work on the reasons and come back stronger the next time. But I think in order to actually be successful with that, you have to work through the emotion. Oh, okay. Because yeah. if you don't, then that come out and it could be catastrophic and destructive <laughs> later on when you're told no, you could explode. Yeah. You need to work through the emotions that come with rejection. Allow yourself to feel sad. Allow yourself to be critical on yourself. Just go through those motions and then shake it off. And then be like, okay, what's my way forward? Yeah. What's a plan that I can execute to just come back better and more improved? So, James, I'm curious, because we all deal with rejection, failure. Do you have, do you have like a formula? Like it, for you, is it like, I'm going to take one day and I'm going to, I'm going to wear it. And then after that it's over. Or like, what do you, what do you do? I'm curious. Or <laughs> Will would say no. Well, one day is too short. I, I yeah, I, I realistically for me, my temperament, how I'm chemically made up, whatever, like I'm just an emotional person. I've always been very sensitive. So I, I allow myself to feel for as long as I can. And thankfully, I have Will, where if sometimes it might have gone a little too long, he'll be like, get with it, snap out of it. Like, you've already felt sorry enough for yourself, like, enough. Um, so you just got to work through yeah. your own time. <laughs> but I do think that, I mean, for the both of us, too, we applied together for the race three tw three times and got it the third, third time's a charm. Um, <laughs> but I think after the initial rejection, I think processing the no or what's wrong with me or what did I do wrong? It's like a week at least of just kind of chilling in yeah. your, in your emotions, but then finding the things that ins re inspire you. Um, and for me, that's, you know, teaching dance or having a garden. It's like reconnecting with yourself. The moment you are told no to find yourself again, Yeah, because it really does, bring you down but if you don't have those um outlets of what makes me me to go back to and like refine that inspiration i think that is when it gets just debilitating of like they said no i can't get out of this rut and i'd be lying to myself and to y'all if i said i didn't get to that point like la is not an easy city to live in like it's filled with rejection day in and day out with everyone just trying to make it in any industry here. And that came to a point for me in 2012, I said enough. I, I didn't feel like I was here, like in, right where I needed to be anymore. And I had like a quarter life crisis, if you know. And I moved to Salt <laughs> I haven't Lake heard that before. I, like that. <laughs> I moved to Salt Lake City, applied to the University of Utah, got in, got uh, my own radio show lined up. I got a bit at a fraternity. Like I was ready to be all in. And how old were you at this point, James? Probably 22, 22 23. 23. Okay. And pre-me, it was before me. I packed up and left. And then after a month, I said to myself, what am I doing? And I just, every day just didn't feel right anymore. I was like, why did I do this? This doesn't make sense. And I read a quote that kind of kicked my ass back to LA. And it said, sometimes you have to go a long distance out of your way to come back a short distance correctly. And the moment I moved back to LA, I still was feeling senses of rejection and being a little apprehensive to put myself back out there. So I started to apply for jobs within reality television because I was like, you know, if actors take acting classes to be actors, I want to be on a reality show. So I'm going to apply for jobs that are within the unscripted world. Okay. So, so, at, so at this point, James, you're, you're, so you moved to LA before yes. you went to Utah. Yes. You were, you, because you had a theater background, yes. you were, you were trying to become an actor and, and kind of 
go down that road, which is yes. which is a really tough one, right? <laughs> it and is. lots of rejection and and all the things, and so then you have this quarter life crisis. You move to Salt Lake City, <laughs> right? And yep. then you re- and then you realize, no, I'm not going to do that. This isn't for me. Yeah, it I'm just going wasn't... back. We're getting back on the horse here, right? Yeah. Okay. So at that point, you're kind of shifting you really shifted gears towards towards reality tv as a focus in terms of of where you want to go for a destination yeah i mean like i think because of the community that i had growing up especially with theater i think i equated that to like oh i must be i need to be an actor in order for me to continue having this community i don't i don't need that i can create community anywhere So I shifted to reality TV because it's something I've grown up watching and I've always been able to identify with someone on a show that made me feel like I wasn't alone. And it really kind of inspired me to be like, I want to be able to share my story. So if I can give any glimmer of hope that like, look where I'm at and look what I've gone through, then that seems incredible just to be able to make that kind of change. So yeah, I applied for a job. And I went in to be like, it was an assistant at this casting office in Hollywood. And as we're interviewing and I'm just being myself at this interview, she goes, have you ever thought about being on TV? And I was like, is it really that easy? Like, I just had to go in for a job interview. And I was like, what do you mean? She's like, yeah, I'm currently casting this new show. It's inspired by the Hunger Games. And I was like, oh my God, I just saw an article on Perez Hilton about this. Yes, I want to do it. And sure enough, like from that moment, I called up my sister, my sister. Sister's like, sure, let's do it. It's never going to happen. We end up getting cast. I get on this show. It's not any of the shows I've ever pursued or ever dreamed of being on, but it happened. But okay, sorry, James, I got to stop for a second. <laughs> it's a lot. Because it, no, it's just what's what's. It's just so interesting because when I meet with people that tell their story of success, just backing up for a second, the fact that you were in tune enough with yourself to recognize that you didn't need to take a break and then also redirecting back to a a new focus and a new, a new strategy to some extent (laughs) as well. And like that, it it changed things. And, and had you, had you never done that? Like that's, that's, that's a 2% factor moment. Had you not been self-aware enough and also confident enough and risk-taking enough to, to do those things at 23? Right? Yeah. Be a different story. Yeah. And then, you know, from that point, I get on the show, I come off of it, and I was like, I think I want to work in reality TV some more. So I get a phone call. Like, so this is the capture, the capture that you went on? The the capture that I was on. And then, like, two months after the show started airing, my friend was like, hey, like, there's an assistant position that's opening up with my company. Would you be interested? I went in to interview it. Turns out it was to be an assistant on America's Next Top Model. And... I was like, can I get an answer to you by the end of the week? I really didn't know if I wanted to work on the show. Like, I was really kind of gung-ho with saying no. And I I don't remember why or what I was weighing the pros and cons out, but I almost didn't take the job. Hmm. And here we are. I took the job. And six months later meet my soulmate through the process and then after he films his show he reaches back out to me and i'm like whoa we're both feeling the same way about each other and here we are nine years later (laughs) that's the short condensed version (laughs) it's really really amazing it really is so you took the job uh you 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 were on right you're on the capture which by the way just talk about the capture real quick and 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 some of the shows that you've been on, what strikes me through that is how um, adventurous they are. I mean, you're talking about true survival skills. Yeah, where you're hunting and you're 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 it's super uber competitive and survival skill focused, and I mean, pretty extreme. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a lot of psychology to unpack with that too. I think a lot of it being because I was bullied or always looked at as less than as a gay man people didn't think i was athletic people never gave me enough credit for being good at something physical and competitive i was always overlooked and so i think that's what kind of attracts me to these like big grand shows is because i feel like i had something to prove maybe i had a chip on my shoulder um but i also do love adventure and i do love getting my hands dirty like that's still a part of me but i also feel like there was more to it that i just felt like i needed to prove something well it's a it's I mean, that's a, that's a depth, right? That's a, a true reflection on, on the why 
um, we we do the things we do. I just noticed it as a it takes a lot of guts. Thanks. I mean, I don't, I don't know, if, <laughs> I don't know many people that would do it, and that and that frankly could do it right. and do well at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, the other thing and that I admire about James is his ability to know when, like, he's in a situation that doesn't feed his soul. When he's in some, when he's in a job or like following a path, and it and he starts to lose himself, he can recognize that on his own. And I think that's an incredible quality. He can remove himself to find that pathway back whether it was salt lake city nobody had to tell him to come back to la because that was a wild thing to do <laughs> he was able to figure that out on his own um and come back to who he was and i mean you i even see it like on a daily basis um now not just when you move to salt lake <laughs> you know you know what's interesting about that will is you know listening to to your two stories and, and story together as well. That's a common bond you guys actually, you share. I agree. I agree. It's true. It's true. It's interesting. I mean, you both had the ability to be introspective mm -hmm. and, and um, I don't, that's, that's not a coincidence on the success you've had. I think that's a takeaway for, for people listening is, is if you're, and and I feel like I've I've learned that over time. Yeah. I don't think I was very good at that, you know, early earlier on for me. You two are much better at it than me. I was <laughs> I was I've learned it later, but you know, to to be able to look look at yourself truly, like take a second, look in the mirror, recognize, you know, what's happening, who you are, it's not easy for people to do. I mean, I will say that we've had the privilege of watching ourselves on television. <laughs> that is a difference. <laughs> um, I do think it probably happened before that, too, of just self, oh, yeah. like being able to reflect. But I think watching yourself on TV is kind of an out of body experience experience um, <laughs> and really forces you to self reflect. So I think that you know, not by choice, um, that's definitely become a part of who we are because that's the exposure of it. Um, we're watching it the same way an audience would watch it, but it's actually me. God, what, a, what, what, me. What, a, what a byproduct that you probably had no idea was going to happen. You're like yeah. you're watching yourself going, well, that's an interesting person. Who's that? It's trippy. Oh, it's me. It's very trippy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's good. That's good. Okay. So James, you, you, you take the job, America's top model, you go on the show, the capture or capture, um, you, you then at that point, is that where the two of you decided to start applying for the amazing race together after yeah, you, yeah. we, we quickly realized we had among other things, but we had a mutual love for reality television and like, Watching different shows growing up. Why are you putting your finger up? Because <laughs> here is here's the moment that I think we knew we could do travel or something together like a reality show. Hmm. Our very first trip together yeah. was to New York City over Valentine's Day weekend in February. The weather was 17 degrees. It was snowing. And we had three suitcases. <laughs> Um, one was 50 pounds, the other two were whatever, 25 pounds, and we're s just trekking these suitcases along in the snow and the sludge. We went to New York without having a place to stay. We bummed around on friends' couches. We slept in one of our friends' closets. We stayed in a stranger's home, and <laughs> the entire trip was like a hodgepodge of just constant what's happening chaos <laughs> but the thing that made it to where oh my gosh we can actually accomplish not only travel but just kind of life together we never argued we never fought with each other we dove deep into solving the problems we were being faced with as two people and it was never us against each other it was always let's figure this out together and i think we came back home obviously exhausted and like what 
what the fuck? But then it was just like, okay, we can do life. We have experienced something that was really stressful. And so I think right after that, that's when we started applying mm -hmm. the first tape that we made for the race. Because um, if you want to learn about somebody, travel yep. together. Yep. I, I'm so curious about this because as I was thinking about you two and, and uh, going on the show and competing, I know way more people that I would never be able to do the show with and compete on an amazing race with compared to the people that I know that you could. I mean, it's a, it's a tough combination. I agree with that. Yeah. So you, you two figured that out pretty quick. James got done with asking different family members, didn't yeah. make it on there with mom. Or <laughs> sister, or <laughs> friend, or, or another friend. friend. So, you, so you two uh, started playing, but you still didn't make it on two more times and yeah. got on on the third time, which yeah. is a real testament to it's, I just want to hit this for one second. So many people try something a time, Once. two times. Yeah, most people one time, and they and they don't they don't have the vision, uh, and and maybe the um, and maybe the fortitude to to try again, but to try eight times. What's your what's your what's your message on that? Eight times you make it not only the ninth time. Not only the ninth time do you get on, you win it. Like, like it, it's, it's crazy. There's a lot to be said about persistence, right? And making sure that if there's something you want bad enough, that you're always persistent with it. But it's also a weird, it's a hard balance, right? Because I think there's a lot of things I pursued or I was very persistent with, and it just never worked out. But I also was able to self-reflect and realize this isn't for me. There was something about this where I just knew, like, I was meant to do it. And I just kept being persistent with that. And every time I was told no, it sucked. But I never stopped focusing on the goal. And when it finally did happen, I was like, the timing of it was the most insane part. Like, it was the perfect time. And I'm a very impatient person. And... <laughs> It wasn't an easy road to get to that point. But when we finally did, I recognized, oh my goodness, the entire path that we've had to get to this point is because of our persistence and just facing the different adversities that might have come with yeah. getting there. And I just, yeah, I, I, yeah. I'm still in awe because it's weird to still talk about because it yeah. doesn't feel like it. Ha it feels like a dream, but persistence and hard work, it really paid off. Yeah. And I will say, like we were saying earlier, and you said you, you are where you're meant to be. And I feel like if we would have got it the first time we applied, we had just moved in together. Who's to say that we were ready? And then the second time we applied, we like had adopted a dog and we're like, I don't know, not really making a ton of money at the time. So leaving for a short period of time would have been a lot on us and we probably would have been a little more stressed out. And then the timing, like he's saying, was just perfect. And I think our advice to all reality people who apply and they reach out to us like what should i do i'm like just keep going like just keep applying but i don't think that it just applies to reality tv in any aspect because like you said most people just do something once it doesn't work out oh well i tried it but if you really want it to happen for yourself it's taking that rejection and saying okay didn't work this time what can i do better to be better for the next audition or job interview. Um, but I also think it's, you need to have a, a levelness of being open. Like you need to be open to what life has for you. And it may not be in the form you've envisioned your entire life. Like I didn't, I could never anticipate what my future looked like ever. Neither. And I know, I know someone who's applied for shows or who's been very persistent. And then now he's like a top producer on a reality show. It didn't go the way he had thought, yeah. but look at him now. Like you're, you're a top dog of a producer on a show. 
all because you were persistent, but you were open to taking a different path yeah. that life presented you. It's so true. The, the, having the willingness to adapt. Yes. That's that, right. that right there. I think adaptability is huge with anything in life. You know, if you look at anybody who's successful, they're adaptable. I mean, right there. I don't, I don't know that I know anybody who's, who's been through a level of achievements in whatever factor it is without doing exactly what you're saying. Completely agree with you. Um, you know, being open to understanding. It's such a weird balance though, right? Cause you, you need to be open, but not too open. Meaning you're, you're open, but you also were very focused, driven, uh, you know, making adjustments along the way, but staying to your true North yeah along the way as well um. yeah i the, i mean even like thinking through the process of sure applying for shows but just in life like we would do like vision boards together at the start of every year we would really talk about our individual goals and also things we wanted to do together um it's that like manifestation too but also setting that path for yourself and spending time thinking through it too of what do i want in my life and that could be whatever you want it to be but i think because of that it has pushed us in the direction that we've wanted for ourselves so we've kind of created it for ourselves love that yeah. love that I'm so glad you shared that last part too about the vision board and the goal setting. I love yeah. vision boards. <laughs> okay. So let's talk a little bit about the amazing race. So you, you get accepted on to the show. You're probably, you're probably flipping out at this point, right? I mean, there's video of us. Uh, well, Will filmed me weeping on YouTube the day we got the phone call. Yeah. And we weren't together, so he picks me up from work, and I get in his car, and I just start, like, bawling my eyes. I just felt like it was such a sigh of relief, honestly, of just, I can't believe this is actually coming to fruition. We're going to be leaving. But the work didn't stop there, yeah. right? We that still was... had four weeks until we left to the starting line, and we knew, okay, well, now we have to get to work. Let's start training. Let's start preparing. Let's rewatch seasons. Let's take notes. Let's so did they conversations with each other about it. Like on that note, James, did they, I, you two are so focused. I love it. Right. You, you win and celebrate. Let's get to work. Yeah. Or not, not win. Sorry. You, you win in terms of getting selected for the show. Yeah. I mean, and, Hey, I thought I was a winner. Just that, that. You're, you're, you're <laughs> that <winning out>. moment. <laughs> Great applications. That's a win, right? So, so you celebrate that and then you say, let's get to work the next day. Do they prep you on the things that you need to, the 2% factor things that you need to consider the small things that make the difference between winning and losing, or you two just have to figure that out. We no. figured it out. But I also think that's what I love about the show, right? Because they're taking people from everyday life and dropping them on the biggest game board imaginable. The, the world. world. And that's what I think makes the show so interesting and why it's been such a success all these years is it's people literally out of their element. Maybe some people have never traveled before. Maybe no one's ever been abroad before. And you're seeing how they handle those high stress situations. And I think because we knew the show, we were able to go back, we, we watched so many seasons, took notes, we were able to figure out what worked for us in, tor in terms of preparedness for the show. So what were uh, some of the things you two decided to do to prepare? Well, we ran that, every that day. you can share, by the way. Yeah, we, yeah, ran, yeah. we ran every day and then eventually started adding our backpacks. So we knew with what weight. it was like to run with them. Then we started to add weight to it just so we could feel what that would feel like on our bodies. We memorized flags. We took six of the most common foreign languages that you've seen on the show and learned like eight phrases in those languages that you would interact with the local on, like where is or how much or thank you, please. You had to get the manners in there. Um, so languages. It's the, uh, it's the Midwest values. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, geography. geography quizzes. Quizzes. We took notes watching every episode that we watched. And I think this is the one thing that really impacted us on the show. It was watching an episode, pausing it and talking through yeah. The decision that they are making, but doing it from our perspective. Like, what would we do? How do we decide 
who's doing a challenge, how do we approach this challenge, and figuring out who would take lead and who would be kind of the follower. You two did your own 2% Literally. factor evaluation of the show. We did. And yeah. we watched, I want to say, at least 15 to 20 seasons mm -hmm. in just preparation. And we did that for every episode. We and then talked through the entire thing. And then talked about which team won. And what, what did they do? What did they do that aided in their success to get to the finish line? Mm -hmm. So what, I, I love this so much. So what were, and we didn't know this before right now. Uh, we didn't know that like, <laughs> that is like the epitome of what were the, the small things that this, you know, team did in order to really differentiate themselves and, and, and get ahead, right? The difference yeah. between winning and losing. So what were a couple examples of some of the things that you saw when you think back to some of those 20 seasons, et cetera, that were things you remember when you'd pause and say, this made a big difference. What, what were a couple examples? I think the biggest takeaway for us with a lot of the winning teams was communication and knowing when to let one person out of the two take the lead. And when the other person knew when to step back. Like when you're in these situations, you kind of need to know your partner, right? It's a relationship based show. If Will and I didn't really know each other, we probably would not have been successful at the race because that's a huge component. So I think when, when it came to communication, it's like, oh, Will, I already knew would excel at this. I'm going to let him take control. You don't need two cooks in the kitchen on Amazing Race. So I think that was a huge takeaway. I also, the thing that's exactly it. it's the leader follower dynamic of challenges you can't have to, you can't both do it no the other part is recognizing that things take longer than they look like they take on television yes and i there were so many challenges we would pay attention like, like such as yeah like if you're doing um I don't know. You create like a structure with all the people, like Legos, whatever. That could be an example. To do that, it could take hours to accomplish a thousand pieces into a structure. Um, but on the show, you see people doing it for 30 seconds. Yeah. And I think paying attention to how long things were taking when we went into challenges, we were never preoccupied with how long things were taking we were so focused on the task and it was going to take as long as it was going to take so we didn't stress out about like oh we're, we're, uh, we're you gotta go faster we gotta go faster and i think that was something that also really impacted just kind of the calmness that we had mm -hmm. so when you so that that was how you prepared right you really cool story, by the way. I mean, you literally weights in the backpack because you're, you know, you got to, got to get used to traveling that way to breaking down each show and understanding, you know, what occurred there that you need to pull, pull from what happened on the show. When you look, when you look at back at, at your uh, season, what were some of the biggest challenges that happened during that season for you? I, it, Looking, I mean, it's been for almost five years since we ran the race. And one thing that has struck me more recently is that we settled into our roles so quick. James obviously is, like you said, just more social and, and interacts with people. He built the most amazing connections with the other teams. And that's kind of where he sat as a team for us. Me, it was like the the preparation, washing our clothes. It was all those little details that I really paid attention to um, when the cameras aren't rolling in the hotel rooms, taking notes or making sure that everything is ready to go so that we don't have to worry about it. So settling into those roles quickly was something that happened. And I think I have like reflected on that recently. Um, I also think that whenever we were presented with a decision because of our prep and because of just knowing each other so well, um, and that risk taker focus mindset that we both have, we made decisions so fast. We yeah. would read something like, okay, this is what we're doing. You're in charge and I'm just, you take the lead. And that was something that set us apart is because we didn't dilly dally in making we have those choices. Yeah. Right. It didn't cause conflict. So you were yeah. efficient. You were efficient because of that too. I, I would say so. And I also think recognizing just from our life experience and as a couple, we are not against each other. Like the goal at hand 
is a goal we both need to accomplish together. So like, why am I going to argue with Will about how he's doing something if that's how he needs to do it to get it done? Like, there's no need to criticize. And I think a lot of teams on The Amazing Race, you see it with any type of relationship dynamic, people get mad at their partner. And I'm like, if that's how they learn or if that's how they need to do it, let them do it. It's that simple. Yeah. And we never fought with each other. It never turned into like Will versus James. It was always us versus the task at hand. Sure, tensions might have been high, we might have been a little stressed and bickered, but we we were more frustrated with the task and we understood that, we recognized it. So if Will's a little snippy or if I'm a little snippy about something, I'm not gonna take it personally, he's not gonna take it personally, yeah. it's because of what we're doing in the moment. I also, last thing I'll say, I, I think that setting micro goals for ourselves mm. <laughs> every day that we were there yes made all the difference the goal of day one was not to cross the finish line that is not day one no day one is to you know that's a long-term goal but <laughs> it's in the back of your mind and i do think teams get so fixated on like the end that they forget that to get there there are so many steps that have to happen a marathon not a the sprint. first thing you do you have to find a taxi you have to be efficient in getting to an airport you have to um you know do a task and accomplish that task before you can do the next thing and so for us it was always whatever's in front of us we need to do it with you know with intention do it to our best ability and then we'll go to the next thing um so those little micro goals that happened along the way didn't cause us to lose our brains and no. thinking about the million dollars that is sitting over there yeah it's so it's so easy to get distracted right and, and, had, and take you off point. journal yes. too like our, our journal was a huge help because again we're visual we make you know vision boards so writing in our journal those goals that we would be reminded of was so helpful and then once we got back home and kind of like let the dust settle a little bit when we reread our journal every little goal we had we did and it's because we raced with intention, but we also you just raced had with fun. intention. Yeah. yeah. It's so it's so interesting what the two of you are touching on is, you know, when you, you think about what Will you said around micro step micro steps and also journaling, as you guys talk about, it, it was a very intentional choices of what you're doing every day connected to the bigger picture. Um and and that part is also uh reflective of real life in our professional careers and in our daily lives. It's so easy to say, well, I, you see on social all the time, well, my goal is to be whatever that is, a millionaire, a billionaire, whatever the story is you see um, all over the place. The, it's good to have a long-term goal, but you need to understand your path to get there mm -hmm. and not, not get distracted and diluted from, you know, some, something that it, you know, that you have to get done today. Mm -hmm. and this week and this month in order to elevate your step those micro steps are key right for life and then the other part james you talked about which was if you look at what you said about you two as a partnership it's also reflective of real life when you think about people listening to this podcast uh, whoever your partner is if you're in a relationship it it's so easy to bring each other down mm -hmm. with not understanding and supporting who each other are. Right. And so when you look at the, how long is the amazing race? It's, it's like four weeks. It's like 23 days. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's four to five weeks of, of an example of real life. And, and so in, in 23 days, if you don't have a good partnership and you don't yeah. accept each other for who you are and how you make decisions and how you process things and how you execute, well, that's going to be a lot of pain. Yeah. Yes. So it's, <laughs> so it's interesting to hear you, 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 you both talk about that. Yeah. And I mean, even like with society, we are so fixated on the instantaneous outcomes. You could, I pick up my phone, order food it'll be here in 15 minutes i you go on social media people post these transformation videos like look at me and then all of a sudden they have a six pack of abs and it's like okay we're not actually like capturing 
any of the work that people are doing to accomplish any of these goals that they're setting for themselves because we're so fixated on the instantaneous uh, results or, I don't know, that instant feeling. Yeah, I think the biggest takeaway too from just our overall amazing race experience, like, and I think you would agree, like that honestly is the hardest thing we've ever done. Yeah. Like you are tested in any and every way imaginable, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, whatever. Um, that when we came back, we hibernated for like a week. Like we didn't talk to people. We, we just stayed in our apartment. We didn't want to do anything. But now, like having been five years, what I've been able to do in terms of life and what I've been able to accomplish, if there's something I get just on like a day to day routine, where I'm like, oh, this seems so hard or this seems so tedious. I'm like, but I did an amazing race. Mm-hmm. This this shouldn't feel hard. And I, I suck it up and I do it anyway. I just get it over with. Before Amazing Race, it took effort, I would say, but now it's like, why, why? I, I did something so hard. I mean, to empty the dishwasher seems like such a to- chore, but I'm like, it's just do it. Just do it. So just do it, it. it sounds like winning the Amazing Race for you, one of the big takeaways was gaining perspective. On... Yes. Perspective. Is, yes. Yeah. Yeah. How about you? Well, same. I mean, when you look at it, like if you think about like your hardest day and what you learned from it and what you learned from, you know, go competing in the race, like what, what's something you've pulled forward into your, you know, current state? I am more capable than I give myself credit for. And that's not only with like physical aspects, sure. Running, I hate running, but I can run like it's, I can do it. But I think I'm way more capable and powerful and knowledgeable and uh than i ever give myself credit for it's like battling that imposter syndrome when you put yourself in any situation yes and then actually doing it you're like oh i can actually do this and now coming we'll explain that for a second just so just so people follow what do you mean by the imposter syndrome sure imposter syndrome means like you're in a career you're in a job and you just feel like you are an imposter like you don't know what you're doing you don't feel like you belong you feel like you are lying you you just can't get out of the hole of believing in yourself enough to know that you are capable of doing the work or whatever it is um and i think coming off of the amazing race you are put in situations that you know, really know nothing about. There was so many things like, what are we doing? Um, but you you accomplish them, and then life just seems a little less... Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Difficult? Because... Like, we don't need to make things more difficult than they need to be. Right. You can actually do the things that you are presented with, and you can tackle anything that's in front of you. Um it's just getting over that hump of like believing you can't. And I feel like that's such, it's less a part of my life now because of the race and all the things that we were able to accomplish in those 23 days. And in, in 23 days, it sounds like for, for two individuals that had developed their confidence over time, it sounds like those 23 days really cemented that confidence. Yeah. Yeah. In yeah. a lot of ways. And it, and it's not just the individual confidence. It's it's the confidence as a team on the race, but also just in life. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was definitely because of the race, which is crazy because it's a reality show. It is crazy, right? Because you're, you're right. I mean, as a, as a couple, too, as a partnership, as a, yeah. as a married couple moving forward into your life with the confidence together that, that you can yeah, drop us in. Where did you go, by the way? Where were a couple of the key locations? Oh, Trinidad and Tobago, Colombia, the Amazon in Brazil, Paraguay, France, Germany, Kazakhstan, India, Cambodia, the Philippines, New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly the first no. time you've been asked that question. <laughs> no. So was I'm going to ask you something about that. Was there ever a moment through the experience where you, you know, where there was real, true, deep fear? Honestly... I have to give major props to the production team. Like, they really are the best production in the business. They really go above and beyond to make sure you know what you're doing, that you feel completely safe, and also educated on where we're going. Like, when we were traveling through the Middle East, they told us to be mindful of, like, 
physical yeah. touch with you. Like, just for them to be that forward thinking where they were looking out for our best interests and us feeling safe, I think is incredible. Um, so I never really felt like, unless it was like an irrational fear, like jumping off a bridge, hello. Yeah, yeah, that I was thinking about that too. Yeah, I what about recognized that? they're not going to let me die. <laughs> <laughs> but there must be a little party that's like, but I've seen videos where you yeah. know, you know, you rethink that. Yeah, I, I, don't, you know? I don't, I don't, I don't know if I was ever. I mean, I had a lot of anxiety, yeah. but I don't know if I was ever <laughs> afraid or had a fear. No, I feel like I was having so much fun and learning so much about you and myself and the world that it just made the experience rewarding in every aspect even if it was something that i didn't want to do um but the anxiety was real yeah like we joked once we got to the finish line like we could do it all over again oh like yeah if we would have left that going. night and done another 23 days we would have been able yeah. to do it no you problem were just, even if you there's were no prize zone, money you attached. Had it down yeah it just, we were just having so much, oh fun. much fun that's so good so you, where do you well, yeah, good. Well, yeah. No, I was going to say, which is like life. Like we talk to each other almost every night. We're like, I'm just having fun. Like, I'm just like, I love life. I love what we're doing. And I just like, never want to stop having fun with you. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's come from the race too. <laughs> uh, clearly, clearly. I mean, the, the, it's such a inspirational story for people to hear on so many levels. I mean, on so many levels, learning lessons, takeaways, personal um, you know, the relationship takeaways that come from this, uh, from today, from this podcast. I mean, it, it truly, I think there's so many people that, uh, that aspire to find a partner like that, where you can go through these challenges with accept each other for who you are and appreciate each other for, you know, for who you are as well to build towards the future. It's, it's, it's what's, what's interesting about the discussion is it's not a surprise that you won. Yeah, but for anybody, for <laughs> people listening, it makes sense. I mean, all the preparation, all the takeaways, all the, all the work and the ability to be vulnerable and reflection and, and, and be thoughtful and intentional. I mean, it, I'm, I'm so glad you won. You deserve to win, you know? Thank, Thank you. you. I don't, I don't know if we were surprised that we won either because it just felt like we had done everything we could possibly do to prepare we had yeah. done everything we we knew that we could have done to get to that point um it was more just like that feeling of accomplishment that like it all paid off it all worked out yes the end. that like wow our hard work yeah really paid off yeah and it just set us up for that next chapter of our lives together yeah so where to from here well what happened what on. happened post amazing race victory like, so, um, when my guess race, is you celebrated then you got back to work that's probably well right. when we did the race i was in grad school yeah i took a semester off and uh finished grad school i work for the state of california department of public health i'm doing something that i love and uh, I work in climate change for the state, and uh, we actually this morning did a house inspection for a house that we're buying. <laughs> yeah. We did, yeah. No, well, congrats! Is, Thank, is Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're we're excited. Yeah, we you know we got engaged on the show, and then the show aired in 2020, and of course with the global pandemic, we didn't get married until the end of 2021. So yeah, we got married had our wedding we went back to new orleans and did it there it was like a full circle moment where we got engaged one amazing race all that great stuff yeah. do you think there's a there's a future show together that you might do do you see that as something that could happen i would what's do on, we would do what's the race. on your what's on your vision board oh if they called we would do the, the race, race like again. right now and they were like hey we need you at the airport in an hour i'd be like let's go bye tan we're gonna get i mean we're gonna go i need to <laughs> get in better physical shape like last time but I would do it. Um, other than that, I don't person for me. I don't know if I would. I think um, the one thing that this is like advice too for for anyone. And the one thing that I love about our relationship is that we obviously have goals for the two of us as a couple, but we also have individual goals. And I think we don't 
I don't allow him to sacrifice what he wants out of life for um for anything. So if you you know, whatever dream you have for yourself, let's let's make it happen for you. And then whatever dream I have for myself, whether it's career or whatever it is, make it happen. Um, but then we also have, like I said, the goals for us individually. So um it's but, like not giving up on who you are, even though we're in a we're married and, and have two dogs and a house now. Yeah. Um, we're still our individual person and not losing that throughout this process. But I would say never say never. Sure. If process. we got the phone call, we would humor. Sure, stuff. sure, sure. I would love to do Survivor, as crazy as that might sound to some people. I'll humor it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to see what happens. I, I think I don't know why. I just I just can see um another one where you're on together when you're, you're too you're too good at it first of all i mean you know, <laughs> hey we're yeah. hoping a winter season of amazing race happens that they did it for survivor and it was so fun and i think amazing race it would that be really makes cool so see. much sense a winner a winner's season yeah. they did do that for survivor I a couple years ago so right yeah. yeah survivors was like what 2020 when it aired yeah season 40 yeah i think they did it on for big brother too didn't they they did it's an all rumored, but yeah, it was an all star. Yeah. yeah, yeah, oh yeah. We have a mutual friend that that was going to be a part of that one. Um, <laughs> so that, that's good. That is good. Okay, um, I want to ask you each a question um, as we as we wrap up that we ask every guest, and I'm going to start with James. Okay. So James, when you look back, what would you say to your 22 year old self? What would your message be? that like my thoughts aren't crazy like you the way you feel and the things you're working toward make sense as hard as it might feel and seem but it will pay off because I, there were so many times where i'm like am i crazy like am i crazy for thinking this am i crazy for doing this am i cr am i just being stubborn no like <laughs> everything i thought and felt and did came to fruition so i would tell my 22 year old self don't feel like you're crazy and just keep at it. That's amazing advice. Amazing advice. And it's, you're so, it's so true. We all have those doubts, right? And those moments where you're, you're looking at what your goals are and trying to figure out why they're not happening. And, and you may question it, mm -hmm. right? You may or I would say, I would take that quote that I read. Sometimes you have to go a long distance out of the way to come back a short distance correctly. I would tell myself that sooner. I would probably tell myself that sooner, knowing what I know now, that it's okay to take a different path completely, knowing that eventually it might just bring you right back to where you were meant to be all along. They say salmon always find their way home. That's interesting because you, you, this was your, ultimately your home destination or, or step along your journey. Yeah. You, know, you found your way back to what you knew was home for you. And I don't mean, physical location as far as LA, right. but, but, but that step along your next, you know, um, chapter in your life. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. Okay. Well, what, when you look back, you know, knowing where you were at 22, right? What would you say to your 22 year old self when you look back? I feel the, the first thing that comes to mind is just enjoy the ride. <laughs> really just enjoy the highs, the lows, the work, the successes, the failures, just enjoy all of it. Um, that would be one thing. Cause I feel like at 22, I was so preoccupied with worry with like concern for the future that I kind of lost sight of um, the moment. Like I wasn't really living in the moment when I was 22. Um, I wasn't enjoying it. And I feel like just enjoy what's to come. Um, that would be what I would say. I think to echo that too, I got my gears going. Um, you only get one. No, I'm saying like, maybe I think in theory, what I would tell myself, because I think it could resonate with a lot of people is, how do I want to phrase this? You don't need to make things harder than they need to be. Mm. Don't put so much pressure. Don't carry the weight of the world on your shoulders. It doesn't need to be as hard. And I think that would be a big thing, too. Because I think you need to always have it figured out, especially at that age. I know people who are in their early 20s right now, and they're like, 
they think they need to have it all figured out. And that's what I think I would tell myself, too. It's like, you don't. Okay, the other one that I'm going to say. <laughs> you get more than one, I'm getting more than one. For Mine, all the 22-year-olds out there, okay. listen up. Um, 23, I, if I was 23, I would say, take risks. Mm. I think that it, there's such an aversion to taking risks, especially as a young person. Um 99% of the time, they're probably not going to pay off. But the 1% that they do, they're going to propel you on a path that you could probably never imagine for yourself, whether it's career or reality TV or whatever it is. Um, don't be afraid to take risks. It's Go ahead, James. You got okay, then I think I would Girl, 20 no, year old. <laughs> Um, truly, truly incredible um, advice and so valuable. I mean, the the fact that you two have been so open to share all these different things, I can't thank you enough. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Uh, true stories of perseverance, of uh, being willing to face failure and push through and power through, to have the courage to take the road less traveled and trust your instincts. If you look at both of you individually and, and together too, I mean, trusting your instincts and knowing that you're going to be okay. And I'm going to, I'm going to do something that's bold and so many different examples from today. Um, just amazing 2% factor moments that you've unfolded, you know, for the folks that are listening. So thank you very much for joining today. Well, of thank course. you for having us. This is this is like great. a nice therapeutic session. <laughs> <laughs> so Where can we send our bill? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I love I love self refl I love this type of self reflection because I don't know if we do it often enough. But I think well, I'm sure we'll be talking about it the rest of the day. Oh yeah, I'm excited. More things will come back mold. I would tell my 25 year old. <laughs> <laughs> You're like at 30. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to work my way up to <laughs> an age now. So anyway, yes, thank uh, you so much for having us. This has been really amazing. And uh, I really hope that people can feel some a little bit of inspiration for their own personal life with us sharing. Yes. Yeah. Well, I can guarantee you that's the case for sure. So thank you for joining. Thank you uh, for everybody for listening to the 2% Factor podcast. Please like, subscribe, and listen more for more stories, incredible stories like Will and James. Um, in terms of what people choices people make and have to make in uh, along their journey to have a massive impact on their life and this is stories that that you don't know until you, you ask the questions and hear hear what really happened so thank you again appreciate you guys joining thank you